Well, hello everybody, and welcome to Unit 1, Module 1, Assessment 1, Anthropometrics. That was, that's the slickest I'll ever be able to do those numbers, so every other time I'm going to be counting back. We're going to start on assessments as the beginning of this. The assessment is the beginning of the patient's nutrition care plan, so it makes sense to start there. It's also, I would argue, the most critical point of the whole process. If you do not get a good assessment, uh, your, your uh, nutrition diagnosis is going to be off, your nutrition interventions are going to be unhelpful, and you may not have a good patient outcome. So the assessment is really where things start. It's important to approach them with a critical eye and an analytical mind. Don't go in there with the idea that you know what's going on. Go in there, open mind, see what's happening. And it's important to remember that assessments are holistic. We're looking for you know, what, what influences somebody's nutritional health? Everything, right? What impacts their nutritional intake? Everything. So you can't just take a snapshot in time of this person. You need to take everything into account. And the final thing is that you can't diagnose from one piece of data. Well, I said the final thing. It's the final thing on this slide. You, you thought you were getting out of it, but no, there's, there's more. You can't diagnose from one piece of data. And the same way you wouldn't want to have one argument for, or sorry, one point for an argument. You wouldn't want to have one citation for a paper. You don't want just one data point. You want many pieces, many, many beads on the string, if you will, especially in elder care. And we'll go over this multiple times. I promise you're going to hear this so many times. It's going to just, you hear it in your sleep. It's going to be tattooed on the inside of your eyelids. We want trend lines. That's the most important thing in elder care. Get out of here, mouse. So uh, we're going to discuss this through the ABCD format. Uh, here's a refresher for you if you would like one, because it's probably been a minute since you've actually heard this. And if you've never heard of ABCD, here you go. So uh, A in the ABCD is anthropometrics, which is what we're discussing now. B is biochemical analysis, because labs didn't fit into the ABCD mnemonic. C is clinical signs and symptoms, and D is dietary intake. So anthropometrics are anything on the body that is physically measurable. Uh, height, weight, skin fold, Braden assessment. And if you had kind of a record scratch in your head, Braden assessment, we'll get there. Don't worry. Uh, it's also anything that you can, ex any data point you can extrapolate from those numbers. BMI, percent ideal body weight. If you can take hard numbers, come up with another one that describes a physical body, that is an anthropometric measurement. Height. Height is um, a sticking point in geriatrics. Uh, it's, it's important, obviously, in every nutritional assessment, um, and measuring it is best if you can. But it's very difficult to get a measure, height measurement in a, for a geriatric patient. Uh, many geriatric patients are wheelchair bound, if not bed bound. If they're not wheelchair bound, they're using a walker or a cane, so they're leaning over. If they're not using a walker or a cane, uh, they still may not be able to stand up completely straight. So it can be very difficult to get a height measurement from them you know, backing up to the wall and taking a, a measurement at a temperature. No, a measurement. Uh, also, some of them are not able to lie out flat. Uh, also, depending on where you are, they may be in a wheelchair, they may be in a in a you know in a recliner. They may not be able to lie out because of a contracture. So it's not really a practical thing to say. We'll just lay them out on a on a exam table and take a measurement. It won't work most of the time. So what are you often are going to have to use are um, height. E uh, estimation equations. And there, man, whoo, there are a lot of them. So uh, you can have your pick. My favorite is the ulnar length, which is from here to here. And then you take a measurement, or, I'm sorry, then you, you take that measurement and you take it to a table to figure out roughly how tall they are. Uh, there's the wingspan, which is, well, this isn't going to work here, but it's from fingertip to fingertip with your arms spread out. Um, also, there's knee height, which I do not like for geriatric patients. There's nothing inherently wrong with knee height. I just find it's difficult oftentimes for the patient to 
bend their knee at 90 degrees for you all the time. All of these are based on the idea that the human body is roughly proportionally the same across the board. We know that's not actually true, but you know, close enough. And estimate and taking a measurement and taking an estimation out of that is way better than asking someone how tall they are. An important thing to remember here, another point we're gonna be going over again and again, is that consistency is the key. You always want to use the same equation every time. Because again, we're not looking for data points so much as we're looking for trend lines over time. So if you're using the same tools, the trend line is still the same, even if the initial measure, even if the measurements are not as accurate as you would like them to be. Does that make sense? Accuracy is great. We still want accuracy, but more important is consistency over time to check on that trend line. Okay, uh, BMI is the ratio of weight to height. I expect I did not blow any minds with that. Uh, not in this group, but just as a refresher here, 18.5 uh, is underweight, over 25 is overweight, over 30 is obese. Now there is an argument made that um, a that that's not accurate for older patients. That a better BMI range for them should be something like 25 to 29. Now sometimes I see 23 to 27. 25 to 29 appears to be the one that we're more set on now. Um, and the reason for this is body composition shifts due to aging. Uh, we'll come to that. We'll come back to that in a little bit. Uh, this is the BMA. BMA? No. BMI paradox. And I have paradox in quotes here because I, I don't think it's a paradox anymore. I don't think there's anyone that disagrees with this or that says that we don't know why. It's just, I guess it's just catchy, you know? It just sounds fun. So, what is the BMI paradox? And that studies appear to indicate a protective effect in elderly patients in the overweight category. Um, the paradox more comes from the fact that this also appears to be true in patients with chronic conditions. It's that being in the overweight category is, in and of itself, a protective measure. Um... The reason for this is that a little bit, the, the hypothesis, I should say, we don't have a reason for it. The hypothesis is that carrying some additional weight over time leads to some passive development of lean body mass. If you think about that, it does make sense, right? If you carried around an extra 30 pounds everywhere you went all the time, you would develop some more stamina, some more strength, just because you're carrying this weight around as you do daily activities. Make sense? So it's important to also think, consider, and we'll come back to this too, that a key indicator of health and well-being and good outcomes for elderly patients is lean body mass. We'll come back to that. But that's, that's really where the BMI paradox comes into its own, is that that lean body mass is so important. Um, now, it's also important to remember that this effect only carries over uh, through overweight. It's still a health risk to have uh, to be obese. A BMI over 30 is still not healthy and it's not beneficial. So I promise you, right? We're going to come back to this. Here we are. BMI in the elderly. Um, overall, BMI is not necessarily considered a good marker for an elderly patient as far as their nutrition and health is concerned. The reason for this is mostly based on uh, age-related body composition shifts. As uh, you get older, the body tends to, uh, tends to sarcopenia, which is a loss of lean body mass over time, and it tends to adiposity, which is you know, gaining fat. If you remember, BMI is based on the idea that this is a healthy weight and a healthy lean body mass to fat ratio. If you do not have that standard, that standard ratio amount, uh, it will throw off your BMI. So again, this is why we often say that one, the BMI might, might should, that's some awesome English right there. It might need to be shifted over more toward the overweight side for elderly patients. Also, why you don't just necessarily put in a BMI and move on with your day. Uh, again, we're looking for trend lines. The idea of what the trend is doing is more important than what their BMI is right now. We also have ideal body weight. 
Uh, again, I'm probably not going to blow anybody's minds here when I tell you that the ideal body weight is considered the patient's healthiest weight. The most commonly used one is the Hamwee. I suspect because it's easy. Uh, you know, I can do the Hamwee in my head. Uh, but just for a fresher here, less than 90% is underweight. Greater than 110% is over. I'm sorry, overweight. And then greater than 130% is considered obese. But, you know, if the Hamwee doesn't do it for you and you do not like easy equations, there's more. There's a ton more. There's here. Here's just three I pulled up, um, and there's more than that. But again, remember that the important thing is consistency. You want the same. You want to use the same tools across the board. So I think this is another reason to you know, be pro Hamley. Um, throughout this course, I'm not going to tell you what to use. You can use the tools you want to use. Just be aware that you need to be consistent with them. And it, when in a professional capacity you want to use the same tools everybody else is using. It's not going to be helpful to anybody if everyone else is using Hamley and you're using Lorenz's formula. Um, so you want the same across the board. Okay, so there is another issue with ideal body weight versus BMI. Um, and to illustrate that, consider this. Uh, we have a woman, 61 inches tall, she's 145 pounds. What is her weight status? Oh, I'll give you a second. Nah, I'm just kidding. I'm gonna I'm gonna move on. If you want to pause and do it, feel free. So if you came up with overweight, congratulations, you are correct. If you came up with obese, congratulations, you are correct. And also everyone's wrong. Sorry. So what's up? Why why is how is that possible, right? Depends on how you calculate it. If you did her BMI you came up with about 27.4, so she's overweight. If you calculate it based on her ideal body weight, she's at 138%, so she's obese. What? Right? Uh, this happens because the BMI and the ideal body weight are actually in no way mathematically correlated. It's, it's two separate formulas. This is why it's important to use the same consistent measurements throughout, because if you use one, somebody else is using another one, you guys may get different results. And it may be a small amount, it probably will be, but it's important to note that it could be a difference between an overweight and obese, and what does that, and what would that mean for your interventions? It's also just a little bit funny, in a dry academic kind of way, to read through the, uh, the literature on this at some point, because it is so frustrating to people that there is not a universal measurement they really, really want one, and there isn't one, and it drives them nuts. Okay, so the last thing we're going to talk about here, after we're done chuckling about that, or I was, you may not be, is uh, assessment of skin risk. This is the last big category for, for this section. The assessment of skin risk is the likelihood or the risk of a skin breakdown. Uh, this is conducted before a wound develops. Okay, it's a once a wound has developed, like due to skin breakdown, well, your risk is 100% at that point. Make sense? So what this does is it takes different categories. It depends on which, again, which tool you're using as to how it breaks these categories up. But roughly, they all assess sensory perception, uh, your ability to move around and, and be aware of your space, moisture, sensation, can you feel something, if you think about when you sit down for a really, really long time and your back end starts to get sore and maybe your your you know, maybe your back hurts, maybe your knees are getting tired, uh, you're aware of that. And if you've lost that ability to feel that that pressure, you're at a higher risk for, for a skin breakdown. Also, uh, mobile check mobility. Going along back to that same point, if you've been sitting down for this whole time, you have probably been fidgeting this entire time, and you may not even be aware of that. Your body does that all the time by itself. But if you've lost the ability to move, to move yourself, um, again, that puts you at a higher risk. And then nutrition intake. And we're going to go more into this uh, later on. We're going to go much more into the weeds on this. Uh, so don't feel like we have to do it now. But be aware it's coming. So on skin assessments, guess what? You've got options. You have many. The most commonly used one is the Braden. 
Uh, but there are others. There's the Norton, there's the Waterloo, there's the Coven and Jacksons, there's the Douglas. And again, these are just ones I pulled up to look at. Uh, there are many. So uh, the most common one you'll run into, though, is the Braden. Uh, it is, again, an assessment of skin breakdown risk. It's the most common assessment, in a large part, I think, because it's easy to do. I will tell you if you ever look, if you ever talk to, say, wound nurses, you will find it is absolutely nobody's favorite one to use. Everybody's got their own favorite. When I talk to the different wound nurses we have uh, where, where I work, I've asked them, you know, what do you think of the Braden? Nobody likes it. What would you like to use instead? Everybody's got their own pet one. No, nobody can agree, which is probably why we also all use the Braden. Uh, it's easy to do. Uh, it's breaks things down into five, uh, breaks down the fields we talked about into five categories. It scores them. And if you have a, the higher your score in the Braden scale, the lower your risk of wounds. That makes sense? Yeah. Uh, also the Braden's not bad. Uh, it's a, has a specificity of 0.82. So it is not terrible. Uh, it's just, I don't know. I guess it's, nobody likes it the same way that nobody really gets excited about a, like, a Honda Accord, although it's a perfectly fine car. Right, and that is anthropometric measurements. Uh, we'll go. Out, we'll see you next time in um, A B biochemical analysis. You guys have a good day. I'll talk to you later. Bye.